You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast coming to you from Santa Barbara, California. Before we begin, I do want to remind you that there is a website that is associated with this podcast. It's called wealthformula.com. That is a place where you can get all sorts of free resources. You can get all sorts of additional information and sign up for some of our lists, such as our accredited investor group, which if you are an accredited investor, I highly urge you uh, to consider uh, so that you can take some of these concepts and things that we uh, talk about and potentially get out the sidelines and make it work for yourself. But let's get on with today's show. And I want to tell you, this is an exciting one for me. I've been looking forward to this for a while. You know, the real estate podcast ecosystem is full of contrarians. And, you know, somehow, and I'm not exactly sure I understand the connection completely, but we got mixed up in a crowd full of Austrian economic dogmatics. And we constantly hear that the sky is falling. You know what I'm talking about, right? They tell us that the zombie apocalypse is near and that you should load up on precious metals as if zombies only accept precious metals like silver as payment. But you know what the thing is with this group? They're usually, you know, and sometimes they're right. I'm not saying they're always wrong. But one thing's for sure, they usually are at odds when it comes to mainstream economists, right? The mainstream economists who are, you know, what's coming out of the Federal Reserve and all that, you know, hear it on CNBC, that kind of thing. They rarely agree on anything except when it comes to one thing. And that is that the demise of America is near. You know what? Ultimately, that idea comes down to the fact that no one can ignore. And that is, there is no question about it. U.S. sovereign debt is skyrocketing. We are spending it on paralleled paces, and that should result in the weakening of the dollar and render it useless, right? Well, as you may know from my past podcasting, you know, I certainly don't believe that at all. I don't believe America is going anywhere. I'm as bullish on our economy as I've ever been, and I don't like, and I have no interest in investing in the Caribbean or anything like that. I've, I've, I've done that, and, well, I shouldn't have. And everything else, for me, is going to be in red, white, and blue. Why? Because we still have the largest economy in the world. We are unrivaled when it comes to ingenuity, that great American ingenuity we all know about. And as far as that ugly dollar, well, it's still by far and away the least ugly currency in the room when it comes to the rest of the world. Now, listen, I'm not denying for a moment that we have problems. We do, but we are also the 900-pound gorilla in the world arena, and that gives us special privileges. Our adversaries don't like that we're in this position, but we have the gravitas to keep it that way by exerting our geopolitical and economic weight, and we will do that. Now, how is this all possible? Listen, I cannot be eloquent enough to explain it, but I will tell you that there is a guy who is, and his name is Marin Katusa, and he is the author of a book that uh, I really, really like and I think you really ought to read called The Rise of America, Remaking the World Order. And in my opinion, again, this is a must read for anyone interested in the future of the American economy. And to be clear, again, now, this is not an interview with a guy who is an academic, a talking head, or an economist. Marin is a very smart guy. He's an ex-calculus teacher, but he is also a self-made billionaire. And he's done that by relying on a significant amount of research and clear-headed independent thinking. Now, independent is the key word there because you can get caught up in this herd mentality and start going along with what people say in various podcasts and, you know, on, on television and stuff like that. But what he does is different. He is a very, very smart guy, analytical guy, and he does his own research. 
And if you need more evidence than his ability to analyze things, you just, you know, look at his portfolio. Anyway, you're going to love this podcast. Do yourself a favor. I'm going to remind you, you know, listen to this podcast, take notes, but also read his book. So when we come back, Marin Katusa. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest in Wealth Formula podcast is a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, the book was The Colder War. And over the last two decades, he's also become the largest independent financier in the resource sector globally. His name is Marin Katusa. And when Marin talks, smart investors listen. And he just released his latest book, The Rise of America, Remaking of the World Order, which I think is an absolute must read and one that we're going to read in our Wealth Formula Network book club. Marin, welcome to Wealth Formula Podcast. Uh, it's my pleasure, buddy. Long time no here. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. So, you know, I, before we get started, because, you know, we, we were talking a little bit offline about where it all started for you, right? I mean, most guys with your background uh, don't end up becoming the biggest independent financier of natural resources. Tell us where you came from, because obviously it's kind of inspiring to, you know, nerds around the world. Yeah, like, um, so born and raised in East Vancouver, Vancouver, and uh, I, I would say it was a great neighborhood back in those days. Um, it was where all the immigrants came, you know, think of it as like the east side of town, hardworking, good people, you know, but it was where you could actually buy and raise a, buy a house, raise a family and, and, and live normally. Uh, definitely, you know, um, the rougher side of town uh, got an academic scholarship to UBC. It was the largest academic scholarship that they gave out. And, you know, I was the first in my family to go to post-secondary and never actually had any ambitions for post-secondary. I was just pretty good at the school. I actually wanted to be, believe it or not, a uh, cabinet and wood maker. I still, to this day, love working with my hands, oh, wow. love, you know, fixing things around the house, and my mother-in-law's place. I just love doing that stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's blue collar boy did well type of thing. So I went to university, um, you know, you know, the scholarship was something called science one, 30 kids across the province. I uh, sorry, across the country, and, and I realized that I didn't want to be a doctor. <laughs> no, no, uh, Smart. no Smart. disrespect to you and your crew, <laughs> but uh, when I was volunteering at the hospital, this I remember this one guy just had his thumb, he was a construction worker, and his thumb was all, I guess, uh, somehow he bursted his thumb, and I looked at that and went, oh, like I just didn't have the <laughs> stomach for it, and I went, I got to change things, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? Here's my scholarship, I got to keep this money. Uh, what do I do? And I said, well, I'll just get a math degree. And, you know, originally it was organic chem and math. And then I was like, you know, I really hate being in a lab for eight hours a day and just like mixing things and, yeah. and, and doing this lab. It was just so pointless, like distilling stuff, you know? And, and so I kind of just stumbled along and uh, one of my math profs was like, Hey, like, you know, there's this course, I think you'd really do well uh, teaching teachers how to teach math. And I went, oh, okay. You know, and they're like, and we'll pay you. And I was like, oh, okay, I like that. <laughs> right? So I would go around every Thursday as part of the program and uh, go teach teachers how to teach math. And then little by little, he became the department head for the education program for math. And he's like, look, I really think you'd be a teacher. And I was like, oh man, teaching like, ugh. Yeah. Just to put things into perspective, my first year in teaching before taxes, before any deductions, was thirty six grand. Mm -hmm. and I remember just sitting there going, "You couldn't pay for like a rent uh, in in a basement suite in Vancouver." So you know, th th these poor teachers are driving an hour, hour and a half into their, their each way to get to this job, and and I just kind of like, okay, what do I got to do to get more? And I knew it wasn't my final destination. I loved it. Started teaching. Uh, review calculus sessions, marking provincial exams, did the whole gambit. And I remember one of the uh, the calculus book that, that all of Canada used, even some places in the U.S., was a professor named Dr. Aria that I was working with. And he said to me, he's like, he goes, he goes get out of teaching. He goes, with all your talents, what are you doing? Yeah. He goes, my book is the book that everybody uses. And he goes, I can barely scrape out a living. And, and he goes, I'm the guy. And I just yeah. went, that really resonated to me. But remember, I, I grew up on the east part of side, side of town, immigrant parents. I didn't even know anyone that invested in the stock market, never yeah. mind someone in the business. So I did stumble upon it through uh, just researching and wanting more. And then really, I guess my first big break was I was teaching these two brothers, uh, calculus, and they were 
uh, one of them turned into a mining engineer and the other one turns into a civil engineer. Anyways, their dad, they would tell their dad about this wacky math teacher uh, who's teaching calculus at the university about, you know, he tried to make it real world. And I started, you know, rather than just taking pure mathematics into this abstract concept, I would just say, okay, pretend you're out of mine. You want to make this pit. And, and I try to make it fun for kids. And they would tell their dad about this stuff. And it just turned out that this guy was, had a big mining company and he was trying to put this uh, tungsten project into production in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Hey, can I, can, you know, he went to his sons to ask if he could meet with me to work on some problems. So he came to my house, you know, I was yeah. a young guy. And then uh, that was kind of, he used my research and I said, well, he's like, how much do I owe you? I go, not to worry about it. Tell me more about your company. And, and that was one of my first big investments in the business. And I learned the hard way about private placements. You don't learn any of that in the CFA yeah. program. Yeah. You any of that. And, yeah. You know, for the first 12 months, I was down 65% of my investment, which I borrowed off my line of credit on the house that I owned. So <laughs> it was, um, you know, the school of hard knocks and just bumbled around. Worked, that worked out really well. Got into uranium very early in 03, 04. Met some of the bigger players. And, and one thing I learned is the bigger guys, they love trying to find young talent to tap into to do the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And that's what I met some of the bigger players at that time, partnered up with them, was mentored by them. And, and today we're bigger than, you know, that whole crew, still friends with all those guys, still manage their money. Yeah. Uh, but kind of, you know, fast forward 20 years later, you know, but I guess this week actually is five year anniversary of uh, actually launching Katusa Research and six years on my own. So wow. that's kind of how we got to where we are. Well, that's, that's just a great story. Uh, and, uh, I love it. Um, as an, you know, as an entrepreneur myself and, uh, it's just fun to see how people's journeys get some where they go. And, uh, especially for a guy who's, you know, an academic guy, a lot of academic guys don't end up, you know, making a bunch, bunch of money because they just get on this track and, you know, you get this uh, Pavlovian feedback that keeps you on that track. People keep telling you how great you are and you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to leave that. So this this is this is good stuff. But I want to get to the book here because uh, I, I thought it was fantastic. You know, I know it, it's hard to you know put it all into a few words or a you know interview, but I'm going to try. But fundamentally, it seems to me like you know the book is really a thesis on you know the U.S. and global debt, the current state of things, and really ultimately what you believe will be the outcome of this mess. Is that fair? And if it is, where are we right now? So take a step back, you know, being in the resource world of mining and energy development for the last two decades, there's this perception that, you know, the U S dollars trash, mm -hmm. you know, all the gold bugs will, will crap on America. And, 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 you know, it's all about China build and make what China needs. And, you know, I, I did believe that for a long time and, 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 you know, for a while that was the game. Um, but while we were in the pandemic and, you know, I'm, a, you know, my lifestyle, I was living on the road for decades, yeah, yeah. Been to so many places, so many projects, yeah. finance, so many things, good, bad, and the ugly learn the hard way. Um, it kind of hit me. I'm like, wait a second. You know, I've always said that when, when, when there's a sell off, everyone thinks gold's the place to be. It's not, it's the U S dollar. And, you know, you put me in a room locked up for a while. That's kind of how the first book happened too, right? Because mm -hmm. after the recovery of my heart surgery, was that eight years ago now, nine years ago? Um, and, and on this one, I was kind of like, I just disagreed with everything uh -huh. everyone was saying. And yeah. part of the success of what I've done is mixing that academic technical ability with, I call it street sense or sure. independent thought. And as I was writing this stuff, you know, I came up with the swap line concept mm -hmm. for mining and, and, and I was getting some really, really well-known famous people, whether multi-billionaires and number one New York Times bestsellers, uh, reaching out to me saying, hey, this is really interesting what you have. And we would mm -hmm. just talk about it. And a mutual friend of ours, Robert Kiyosaki, and his wife Kim would be, hey, what about this? And, and it got my brain going. And as I, you know, all these people are bringing these ideas and talking. And I started, you know, thinking about all these things. It, it just, as I was writing the newsletter and part of the, the, the best part of writing a newsletter, it forces you to write out your thoughts of what you've come to your own conclusions, but you put it on paper so other people can read it and challenge it or dissect sure. it. And you really hone in on writing. And it's just been what I've been doing for 20 years. And that's just how I work my thoughts. 
And then I was kind of looking at going with all this stimulus coming and you look what's going on, what will be the end result? And, you know, you look at what uh, Powell just said today, and let's say July 14th, he said, a very large amounts of fiscal capital is going to be, it's going to happen. Yep. And it's not just going to go to the way business used to be. It's going to have new um, rules and expectations. And that's where I came up with the whole carbon credit angle and, and, and what that's going to be. Remember that goes back to 2015 when 2014, when I was doing the heavy uh, green energy projects that we did really well with. So it kind of put it all together. And as I would work it out, um, it, it was just this whole thing that everyone in our world of mining and, and oil and gas and energy fix that America's done. And as you look at from the demographics, from the logistics, from the resource standpoint, from the global macro perspective, I say nothing's further from the truth. And I get it. You know, mm -hmm. you look at the media, it, nothing's been more polarizing than just watching the news. It's disgusting, actually. It's not even news anymore. It's an agenda. For example, uh, my book, the second book, hit number one in America for sales the second week off for both fiction and nonfiction. It's very rare that a nonfiction yeah. business book goes number one. Not a single tier one mainstream media picked it up. My publisher and the, uh, you know, you have a, like a PR firm yeah, yeah. with the publisher. They do all that stuff for you. My first book was about, you know, the Cold War and it was about, you know, and, and remember my previous company had that anti-America ledge because the, mm. the, the right think that, you know, America's going down and I had everything from, you know, CNN to Bloomberg to Fox, mm -hmm. to both spectrums from the far left and the far right. People love that fear and the doom and, and then the, you know, the division. This book was like, hold on a second. It really doesn't matter if it's Biden or Trump in power. This is what's going to happen. And how wild is it that your book is number one, both yeah. on Amazon for fiction and nonfiction and the Wall Street Journal. And the New York Times didn't even mention the book mm. and it cracked number one in sales. Um, not one tier one media picked it up. And my publisher was like, what the hell's going on here? Like, yeah. So they, they have these relationships and they basically said, that's not the narrative that we want on our show anymore. No FOMO. I don't know. I think it's news. That if, yeah. Like, <laughs> For example, my book, uh, I think it was the second or third week. I think it was the, they, they published the results in the third week. So the second week, my book sold two and a half times more than the second place book. That's news. But yeah. they didn't want the whole thing that, hey, America's not dead. The politics, the media, they just didn't want to hear it. But it's guys like you and Robert Kiyosaki and, and, and all these different outlets that are saying, hey, wait a second. We should talk about this. And no one's looked at the track record of our, you know, our, not just our newsletter, the funds, we're the top of the industry. We're also the largest financiers in the industry. Right. So the bankers don't like this story either because we don't take fees. I'm trying to, I, I turn the whole system upside down, contrarian, and they don't want this message out that, hey, for example, I use this analogy. Look, look what happened to Jack Ma for just making a couple of statements. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now think about, Elon Musk, after he basically flipped the fingers to the regulators and the SEC and flat out said, I don't respect them. If Jack Ma said that in China, right. imagine what would happen to him, considering what he said, what Elon Musk, and basically within two years of Elon Musk saying that, he became the world's richest man. Right. What's happened with Jack Ma? Look at right. today, China's you know threatened uh, Japan saying, we are going to nuke you if you get in the way with Taiwan and try to defend Taiwan. So what I'm, and, and, I, and I get into all these different aspects, the geopolitical, the space race, I get into the critical metals. I get into, you know, um, for example, uh, just a simple message that I talk about that, you know, for the last 20 years, Europeans and North America have basically turned a blind eye to the pollution that is caused by the manufacturing in China because of North American European demand goods, right? Yeah. So this report came out today that, hey, of the most 25 polluting cities and, you know, 20 or 22 or 23 are from China. Yeah, but China's just making the stuff that the Europeans and North Americans want. Because it was cheap, everyone kind of turned a blind eye. Pollution, carbon dioxide, uh, the NOx, it's all these different, uh, uh, you know, CO2Es, CO2 equivalents, the footprint, that is a byproduct. That's a commodity. That is a pollution that needs to be dealt with. Now, ask yourself this, book. 
Amazon is the world's largest facilitator of pollution on the planet, but yet they don't talk about it. You now go buy a plane ticket, it'll tell you your carbon footprint across the US and North America and Europe. It's part of the whole funding, mm-hmm. you know, the bailouts, that's the new thing. You obviously, step two is gonna be you're gonna pay for that footprint. But Amazon, all they have to do with the data analytics they have and all the technology that they have right now, they can show, why can't you in your profile say, hey, I wanna buy net zero products. America has low cost energy, it has the funding, and now the robotics, it can compete and have net zero products with things that are being produced out of China. So you think about the footprint of that, that would turn China upside down. Mm -hmm. Walmart, same thing. You're telling me that they know exactly to the decimal where these things are made, uh, the materials, the, 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 the carbon footprint of all this stuff, but they don't want it because it, it's going to uproot their system. And they don't want to kind of think, but think about the Waltons people became probably the wealthiest family of all time by being the largest facilitator of pollution. They didn't have to pay for it. Yeah. Jeff Bezos, probably the wealthiest individual easily today, didn't have to pay for the pollution. That's going to change. Right. Right. And that, right. those are all the aspects and the other aspects, not a single analyst in the business includes the carbon footprint cost moving forward on any of these projects financials. And this is what I've been doing for a couple of years. And I'm telling everyone, Hey guys, you know, when you, when you do your IRRs and MPVs, it's great to just calculate how much gold or oil or copper you're going to make. You also got to like cover your um, tailings pond and your reclamation, which all those things you have to do, but you're going to have to include your carbon footprint also. So every project that we are involved with in the finance, the company has to make a commitment towards reducing the carbon footprint. And everyone keeps going, oh, American carbon credits are a tax. I go, bullshit, they are. Yeah. It's a commodity. And here's the best part of it. The guys who get it, what they're realizing is by going net zero and reducing your carbon footprint for these resource projects, you're actually reducing your cost of capital significantly. The guys who don't because they just don't believe in it and they, they're zombies. Why would you invest in a zombie? They're going to be, it, it all, basically business comes down to cost of capital. And if there's two guys producing the same thing, let, let's just be, let, look, if this assets are pretty much the same, the technology, both guys know it. But if one guy's cost of capital is 3%, the other guy's 7%, who's going to win in the long run? Right. Well, it's obviously cost of capital. And that's all I'm trying to explain to people. But my God, has that turned into a, a rat's nest for me in the industry? Because a lot of guys don't want to accept it. And, and frankly, it's just a bunch of old dudes and bankers that yeah. have a nice system and, and the, the boards and all that. But that's why I avoid those companies. And we don't do many deals, but the ones we do do well and we stick to it. So that's kind of how the book happened. Uh, just by writing and publishing, giving talks, people would come back to me. Sure. And uh, it turned out to be a 450 page book. Uh, mm-hmm. The first one was 280. So it gives you a context of, you know, it's, it's, it's a deep read, but I explain why it's 2% inflation is the target. You know, everyone here today, Jerome Powell kept emphasizing 2% is the number. 2% is the magic number. Mm-hmm. We're always going to stick to 2%, but they don't ever explain why it's 2%. So I, I go into the history of why it's 2% and it, and it, goes yeah. from New Zealand back to 150 years of gold production, how the economic cycles are based on that and why. These aren't things you're going to learn in business books. Yeah. It's just kind of being a large investor in these things and traveling the world and figuring out. And the last thing I would say, for everyone who thinks that America's best days are you know, behind it, jump on a plane and go to yeah. South Africa today. Yeah. Jump on a plane and go to China. Jump on a plane and go to India. Jump on a plane and right. travel across Europe. Just, just do it. Rent a car from, you know, wherever you want to go. Drive through Spain, Portugal. Go all the way, you know, France. Go, go up to Germany. Go through the Balkans. You want to see unemployment rate? You want to see uh, how bad it is? Mm-hmm. Go to uh, Russia. Uh, go to the, you know, the former Soviet Union states. So will America always be an empire? Number one, of course not. We all know that things, but remember it took 700 years for the Roman empire to fall apart. Right. So people forget that there's evolutions and, 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 you know, and I get into the, you know, central bank currencies Mm -hmm. and and the digital currencies and all these different issues, you know, I I get into gift and good and and these things that people don't talk about. Is it, is it an easy read? I don't know. You tell me, I doubt it. I doubt it. It's something that, you know, uh, the average, the person who just wants to talk about sports betting 
that's not going to be a book for yeah. them. But if you want to better your macro understanding from a guy who's, you know, yeah. balls deep into the industry, it's an insider's take. Yeah. And, and, um, I actually think it's, you know, you do have to be awake when you're reading it, right? It's not, it's not like, it's not. Hopefully a, it's uh, not what you read before to go to bed. To right. go to bed. You, you have to, <laughs> you, you have to be focused and, and, but it is there, there's, uh, there's lots of really cool stuff. And there, one of the things I did want to get a chance to talk to you about, because I do think it's an idea of central importance that I get, I'm sure that very few people know what you're talking about. This is sort of the inevitability of what you call, you know, the, you know, basically the coordination between the Fed and the government that kind of, you know, if it fails and the likelihood of something that is known as, um, as AMT and yes. it's such, so, it's such a, an important thing, I think for people to understand because, you know, even for me, Marin, when I think about, you know, when I, when I listen to people and I look at what's going around, I'm like, gosh, that is a lot of debt. But then I asked myself, does it debt even matter anymore? And so fundamentally, that's kind of what this addresses, this this potential transition. So let's first talk about why I had a whole chapter on this to understand yeah. that does it even matter anymore? Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to explain to people is it's just so we've gone, you can't use linear mathematics when you're in a quantum course, right? It's just different math. Um, you know, it's like looking at Euclidean geometry, remember back in the school, it's just mm -hmm. different, right? And the problem with most analysts is they're, they're, they're applying linear techniques to a quantum framework. And what do I mean by that? Everyone just assumes they jump right into the MMT, you know, lots of guys like Peter Schiff, they're like, ah, they're printing, there's no discipline, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, MMT, First right. of all, we're not at modern monetary theory, which is MMT. We're not there yet. And I get and I explain what MMT is in really detail, mm -hmm. what it is. But I say before we get there, we're in something called FMC, which is fiscal monetary coordination. And guess what? The guy who invented FMC is the guy whose name is on the Federal Reserve Building, Marion Eccles. Now, how this all happened is kind of an interesting story. When you, tr when you, when you go through on book tours and you do all this stuff, they, they take you to all these things and, you know, you give a talk at the New York Stock Exchange, and New York, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at it and then in, in 20, when was my book tour? 2014 or whatever it was, 13. Mm -hmm. um, I looked at that name and, you know, if, if, it's kind of like the boy named Sue. If you got a weird <laughs> name growing up that no one could ever understand, you got a chip on your shoulder. And I went, <laughs> Marion Eccles, that's a guy who probably right. got you know, right. beat up as a kid because of his name. And I go, who the hell is Marion Eccles? Yeah. Well, he was the most powerful Fed Reserve of all time. That's why his name is on the building. This guy behind the scene was through more presidents than anyone else. He's the guy that implemented FMC, Fiscal Monetary Coordination. So think about it. What financed World War II? Everyone's like, oh, J.P. Morgan. Bullshit. It was, it was the Fed. Okay, It was Fiscal mm -hmm. Monetary Coordination, meaning the Fed, and the Senate got together and said, this is what we got to do. The expansion of West, what built all the dams, like the Hoover Dam? You know, guys just like, look up guys like uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Industries. These are names mm -hmm. that nobody talks about today. But back in the day, he was kind of like the Elon Musk of his era. Like he built these, uh, uh, these boats faster than anyone else. That really helped in the, in, the, in the war effort. And he basically turned his industry and said, we're going to become, uh, you know, help the military effort. And, and the government funded all of these private work projects with private enterprise, but as a coordination effect. That was done, FMC. What we're doing right now is the exact same as what happened and built America's West. Now, of course, it's going to be coordination. How, how did Jerome Powell know that today when he said, and I even tweeted it, very strong fiscal support coming. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's yeah. actually 3.5 trillion. They talked about, remember, 1.6, 1.8, yeah. maybe 2, 2.2. Why three point? Do you really think this is the last one? Yeah. Of course not. Right. It's going to be trillions and trillions. But now think about it. It's these are not printing presses. These are digits. Right. And it's investing in their system now. Debt actually, when I get into the details of what this all happens, is the dollar went up on this news, mm -hmm. and so did gold. Gold's up twenty bucks today. So what I'm trying to get at is yes, you know, there again, in the old days, my my former mentors and partners would be like, Marin. 
what the hell are you talking about negative interest rates? I would go up on stage in 2012 and go, we're going to get into negative interest rates. Uh-huh. I remember my good buddy, Doug Casey, who's a very close friend of mine. He goes, man, well, that, that's <laughs> metaphysically impossible. I'm like, no, it's not. And he goes, what do you mean it's not? And we would get into this debate publicly. I'm like, Doug, of course you can have negative interest rate. He goes, well, who the hell would ever do that? And I go, it's about convexity. And then I talk about that in my book. And it's not just uh, a couple of idiots in the market that are willing to take negative interest rates. It's trillions and trillions of dollars. So there's a new paradigm. It's evolved. The bond market in many sectors you're not, it's not about what you're getting on the coupon. It's, it's what the, what the, what the coupon trades yeah, at. Yeah. Right. So I get into that in the book. And, and then what I was trying to get when the whole conclusion of this is there's trillions of dollars in ESG funds. Like when you think of home Depot, you know, like the place where you go buy like paint when your kid breaks your wall and, and you got to putty it mm-hmm. up and you sand it and you do all this stuff like home Depot lumber and yeah. lawn supplies and crap. Do you think that that should be the eighth largest holding in the uh, ESG, you know, uh, ETF? Yeah. But it is. Where's most of that yeah. stuff made? China. Right. Right. So what I'm getting at is there's no options. Like these right. ESG stands for uh, environmental, social, and governance, right? It's got to fit mm-hmm. those three criteria. Because how many mining companies meet the criteria? How many oil companies? None but I lay out the business framework of how you can meet that. And then instead of paying 10% interest for a gold mine, you can pay three. That's huge. Mm-hmm. That difference, that 7% difference is the difference. It, it doubles the free cash flow mm-hmm. of the gold mine. And, and, and in the gold mining business, you have windows. Remember, because the price is so cyclical, it's all about payback period. If you can reduce your payback period, that is truly golden. So I get into all these facts and, and there's so many misconceptions out in the market. Like gold can't go up if the U S dollar is going up. I was like, hey, that's wrong. You're going to see both gold and the U S dollar go up. Uh, oh, you know, they're going to print all that money. The U S dollar is going to go down uh, wrong. Uh, and there's also fed Powell basically said today it's evolving and give us time to prove what we're doing is right. And he basically said there's the inflation, it's about 2%. And if you break down the different components, not just about lumber, which you see pull back in price, it's about wage inflation, all the different factors. So we're not yet at MMT and it's going to be many years before we're at MMT. But uh, when MMT does kick in, it's going to be multi-decades. You see the framework that these Federal Reserve and the Senate use for funding, it's not like a company that does quarterly budget meetings. These are, it's, it's think of it as a huge freighter and it takes so long for it to play yeah. out and work its way yeah. through the system. So that framework will be around for many decades. Eventually, of course, it's humans and politicians. Politicians are guaranteed to fuck well, it up. Let's, That's let's what they just do. real quick to talk about MMT. The concept is a, a tricky one because basically in this MMT, is essentially debt doesn't matter. And instead of, you know, worrying about repayments, worrying about what's backing what, you had a concept that I thought was pretty interesting to, to, um, to use as a framework, which was the looking at the uh, enterprise value of the U.S. The as sort of backing, uh, backing the concept. And to me, that made a lot of sense. So if you could take a second, explain, you know, in a very basic terms, what MMT is and why that would be possible because of the enterprise value of the U.S. Okay, so, you know, there's a saying that people say that, you know, debt doesn't matter. Well, it depends on your balance sheet. What is the value of your balance sheet? Let's take America as a whole, greatest military on the planet. You know, if you could pick a country from a, from a land mass, it's the best situated country on the planet when you think about where it is to invade it is incredibly hard. You have the the Rocky Mountains, you got the Mississippi River, you got the Canadians up north, which you know it's like the little brother of the US. You got NAFTA in the back, but it's kind of teared down. Incredibly rich in resources, natural gas, oil, uh, rare earths, uranium, copper, gold. People forget how wealthy America is. 
innovation and technology. So the, the big harbinger of America was well, electricity costs. Well, you know, look what's going on with electricity prices. Texas has become the Saudi Arabia. And I was like, oh, but it froze and everything shut down. Remember, these are still early days. This is just going to get better and better in costs and software technologies deflationary. So you have that improvement. Second, the key component of MMT is to maximize employment of your society. What did Jerome Powell talk about today? He goes, look at the unemployment of the African Americans and the Latino population. It's way higher than when, uh, if you compare it to the whites. Secondly, he said, just before COVID, it was at the all time lows, but then COVID happened and then it all unraveled and it, it literally doubled and tripled, tripled in unemployment rates faster than the white population. So what MMT is trying to do, using technology, imagine you can break it down. It's eventually gonna break down into sectors where where the stimulus is needed is going to get it rather than just throwing it towards the economy, which now it's, you know, in an emergency patchwork, bail out the airlines to keep the system going, bail out the rail lines to keep the system going, right? bail out the unions to keep the system going, but that doesn't really help the bottom up. So what MMT is all about is, you know, optimize uh, employment, minimum in unemployment, and what taxes are about is to keep the demand in the circle for the currency, right? So it's not just about the U.S. being the largest currency for global trade, like in oil and technology and commodities, but the whole point of taxes isn't to pay back the debt. It's to keep a demand on the other side mm -hmm. of the balance sheet. So think of it as two parts of the balance sheet, the government side, which invests the money into their enterprise, and then they clip back, not to pay back the debt, but to keep the demand in the value of the US dollar within the system. That's the missing part that a lot of people don't get on that. Yeah. So, but we're not there yet. And, right. and, and it's cool to talk about MMT as if, oh, it's gonna screw everything up because they're just gonna print the, you know, unbelievable amounts. Well, they're gonna print unbelievable amounts of money. Like today, they just committed three and a half trillion. Right. Um, and it's not gonna end there. And I, and I talk about all these things, it's going to be tens of trillions, but they're going to modernize the economy. And you can sit there and bitch about this, that it wasn't like how it was when your dad grew up, or you can say, fuck it. This is the framework. I see where the puck is going to, like Wayne Gretzky says, how can I get my piece of the action? And I right. think the lowest risk way to do that is carbon credits. Right. So let's talk about carbon credits. What are they carbon streaming? Talk about the, some of these things that you've been talking about in your newsletter. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it was a concept that I first published, I think it was in 2014 or 15, when Ross Beatty was building up uh, Altera, which was Canada's largest green energy company. And, and, and I guess I'm showing my kind of age in this business, but in 2009, Obama came in. It was the green dream. Remember how everyone's going to yeah. do geothermal and solar, yeah. you know, all this stuff. And, and, and I was, you know, like I'm just a math guy. And I'm looking at this going, holy crap, this stuff was getting crazy valuations. So, for example... Uh, Ross's company at the time, Altera, was about 25 bucks a share in 2009, and they hadn't built anything yet. Uh -huh. But you see how these analysts would do this, was they would do MPBs and, and show all this stuff. And I remember I was at a Casey conference. I was the moderator. We had three billionaires on this panel, Rick Rule and a guy named Bob Bishop were there. And they're talking. I remember my buddy Rick goes, I'm embarrassed how much money we're going to make. It's like the ultimate ATM is just going to print out money. In theory, Yes. So someone, you know, like these are, you're at a conference. I'm, I was asked to be a moderator. I'm not here to stir the shit on the panel. And someone in the audience goes, hey, Mary, you're the mathematician and you're usually pretty opinionated. What's your opinion on these valuations? And yeah. I said, look, these guys are billionaires. I'm not. So take my opinion with a grain of salt. Um, they are priced to perfection. There's a videotape recording. I was a lot chubbier back then. And I go, they're priced to perfection. And there's no upside. They have to do everything they say they're going to do. And it's hard. Building stuff sucks. It's yeah. really hard. Yeah. Nothing ever goes as planned when you build, you know, a big geothermal plant or a big copper mine or a gold mine. It's just stuff that you can't even think about. And everybody was relying on these technical reports. And I go, I taught probability. And, and at the time, I wrote an article in 2009, P, so what? Because the whole industry was basing these things on probabilities. A company called Geothermex that got bought out by Schlumberger. Uh, was writing, you know, all oh, this 100 megawatts with a P90 and all these bankers were like, oh, ah, ah, look at this, look at this. And I was like, oh my God, like this is so false. They're construing what this even means. 
And I go, that's not how probability works. So literally within, I said, I don't know, I think it could correct 50, 60, 70% in the next few years or six, I go, I have no idea, but why would you buy something that's priced to perfection? Literally, but within uh, 2014, the stock went down to three bucks a share from 25. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Best part, they did build everything they were saying they were gonna do, and they had all those complications. And now this thing, nobody wanted it because Nobody wants to stick around during construction, right? You get, div- yeah. I call it divorce desk, right? You know, you ever right. built a house with your wife or rent all a house? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good luck with that. Right. I call it divorce desk. And that's, what's like building a big project. You have rock slides, you have injuries and, and all this stuff happens. And fast forward five years, I'm sitting there going, this thing's trading at 30% now it's built and no one cared. So I became the second largest shareholder of the company. And I tried to, people didn't know what, what is 200 megawatts. Like people couldn't relate. I know what a hundred thousand ounces of gold a year of production. They can kind of visualize mm-hmm. it. They can visualize what a barrel of oil looked like. So I came up with something called GBOS and I showed all this fancy math mm-hmm. and I'm sure you've read it in the book mm-hmm. and I kind of show all that stuff. And then that's when I said, geez, you know, a byproduct, you know, when you, when, when you build the whole, the best uh, business model in mining is, is streaming royalty. And that's when I published that, hey, like these green energy Mm -hmm. companies, when they build this, they also have a byproduct of carbon credits. Yeah. And at the time, I was just a bit too early. And and people thought I was a wacko. And they were like, what the hell is Marin talking about this fancy math? And it was at the point that, like, I know a bunch of the directors of the biggest oil companies. um, And and for example, Canada's largest uh, oil producer is called Suncor. One of the directors, I walked them all through this. And they said, yeah, yeah, cool math. Don't know what the hell you're talking about, but we're not going to get into the green energy business. I go, you could buy all of this for less than 10% because of the cost of capital. I go, you're insane. You can double your green barrels of oil production if you take your, and you can start unwinding your barrels of oil and start producing green barrels and your cost. Of, and they were like, what the hell are you talking about? One of America's largest oil companies, the director who's, who endorsed his names on the back of my first book. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was like, uh, yeah, this is really out there. Uh, you know, you know, when you kind of have an idea that yep. no one's been done before fast forward five years, uh, about a year ago, these guys were like, Hey, can you walk me through your Jibo stuff? So I said, sure. And these are guys I knew from like 10 years ago and, uh, they were building this company and I thought, Holy crap, these guys are doing what I was talking about five years ago. So, you know, I became the largest investor in the deal. And now you see, in the carbon credit. So what is a carbon credit? Well, carbon credit, one credit of carbon is the equivalent to one ton of carbon emissions in the atmosphere, right? Mm-hmm. So and you have different forms. You have NOxes, you have uh, methane, all these different types of CO2 equivalents. And it all came, started back from the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and, and, and it was kind of the wild, wild west days. And, and that's like anything new. And now it's evolved to the point because of what happened in Paris and you have a mandatory compliant carbon market and you have a voluntary carbon market. And I started digging into all this research about a year ago and you you read it as a subscriber and I was saying, this is wild. During the pandemic, as I'm writing my book and thinking about all this, I just thought with the world shutting down, we're gonna reduce our carbon emissions by like 50%. Yeah, That was kind of like my gut call. When we looked at the data, it reduced it by like 3%. I was like, what huh. the hell? So I started digging into it. And for example, if you take every vehicle on the planet, you know, car, yeah. everything, every car in India, and China, and Russia, and Canada, and America, everywhere, Europe, everywhere, take every car in the world that burns gasoline or diesel or propane and or compressed natural gas and, 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 and put it into like, say, one basket the carbon emissions from every vehicle on the planet is about equal, a little bit less than the carbon emissions just from annual Chinese concrete production and consumption. No kidding. So why? So as I was digging all this, I'm like, what? I'm like, really? I'm looking at all these data. Because remember, I'm a data nerd, right? And we're doing all this stuff in spreadsheet. Well, it's because how you make concrete to make cement it goes back to the egyptians nothing's changed technically from the carbon uh, sorry from the concrete to make cement you've got to basically roast the crap out of the limestone 
And for every ton of limestone to convert it into cement, you release one ton of carbon. And that's a huge opportunity to sequester carbon from that atmosphere at the point. But China's moving forward. And if you start looking at the data, it ain't going to stop anytime soon. So that's when I started thinking, going, holy crap. So everybody's focusing on, you know, I'm going to do my part by buying a Tesla and I'm just going, okay, well, that's great <laughs> that you're doing your part, but you're really doing fuck all on the, on the grand scheme of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I started looking at things going, okay, how do you sequester? The best way to get rid of the carbon is at the source, right? Whether it's a gas well or the cement mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. or whatever. And I started looking in the, in the, in the first thing that the UN was funding after the Kyoto Protocol was obviously plants, right? And, and they would screw up huge, like in Brazil, the UN funded a poplar uh, plantation because poplar trees grow a lot faster than other trees. But what they didn't expect is the second order thinking, right? So what happened when they went down? Well, a bunch of, you know, expats would go to Brazil with a bunch of UN money, hire the locals, which meant it made it way more expensive for the local farmers to be able to do what they were doing. Poplar, because it grows fast, sucked out so much water and now that created issues for the other farmers. Right. And then the 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 way the, uh, the bacteria and the different plantation and, and the bugs, it, it just caused the shit show for the locals. So it was trial by error, right? And, and that started evolving. And as I started doing the data, I stumbled along things like, you know, the ocean is getting harvested. You know, everyone knows about the rainforest harvations, mm-hmm. but people aren't paying attention to the mangrove. Uh, deforestation by Chinese shrimp farmers. And I was like, what the hell is this? I started researching it and going and figuring this stuff out because the mangroves are basically, think of it as a forest in the ocean. It's where the ocean meets uh, the coastal waters. And think of it as almost like swamps in the ocean. And 70% of the tree is underwater, 30% above water. The, these, these companies come and clear cut it on the water so they can do, it's like the perfect environment for shrimp farming to meet the Chinese demand. And I was starting researching this going, I, I never thought about this before. And then I started doing separate research and I'm like, wait a second, per square kilometer of this absorbs 10 times the carbon from the environment than, than uh, equal size on land forest and like a temporal rainforest like Pacific Northwest uh-huh. and, and whether it's Seattle or Vancouver, the coast, the Vancouver Island, whatever. And I'm sitting there going, holy crap, but it's not even that. You're going to have second order effects like your, your, the corals, the, the, you're saving the turtles, the biodiversity, the, the sharks, the whales, it, everything on it. And I'm going, wow, all because of shrimp heart. Uh, but if you take these things out, it takes a long time for them to grow back. You never hear about that in the media. So as I was writing this stuff and publishing, I'm going, there's something here. But who's going to fund this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Because you're competing with these big, you know, fishing companies that are backed by the government of China and all these different places. And um, and the Japanese aren't, aren't uh, angels either in that sector. Sure. So I said, fuck it, I'll do it. And, and that's yeah. how we started investing. And now the company is one of the largest, I think it's the largest uh, carbon credit producer in the world and, and is moving forward. And, and what it's about is taking the risks I learned in mining, taking the best business model, which is streaming and royalty and getting near term cash flow. And I think the biggest upside is going to be the voluntary carbon market. So what is the voluntary carbon market? So if you take compliant, that's like the government saying it's going mm-hmm. to do this and you have this many emissions allowed. That's fine. I, I don't want to screw around in the government because you have to deal with bureaucrats, yeah. politicians, and that, that's that. But the voluntary market is, for for example, if you take Shell. Last month, Shell lost on the Dutch yeah. Supreme Court the ruling that, hey, you have to reduce your carbon footprint. So what are they going to do? They probably produce like 130 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. The next day, Exxon. Now, I, I want to take you guys into a little bit of nerd oil history there was a guy i had lunch with his name he's passed now he's a really maverick like a cool badass guy his name was t boone pickens Mm -hmm. t boone was known as the first you know corporate raider in the oil companies and he'd have to buy five or ten percent and then he'd merge the companies get rid of useless management and optimize shareholder value he became like the first hero for shareholders right because guys were milking the tip for a long time from former seven sister companies so anyways, this guy would have to put up serious dough, like to buy five or 10% of the company. Sure. 
a, comp, a hedge fund that nobody's ever heard of called like engine number one, put up 20 million bucks, 20 million bucks. And they were able to take on the board of Exxon. Now, I can't guarantee this fact that I'm going to say next, but I'm willing to bet that the board of Exxon and the management of Exxon spent millions and millions and millions in legal fees and PR to uh -huh. take on this little company. So let's call it 20 million bucks. Sure. Like, think about it. 20 million bucks for a big oil company to deal with their lawyers. Isn't that much money? <laughs> yeah, right. And a little fund for 20 million bucks was able to turn the whole board upside down, got two board seats that, you know, 40, 50 years ago, T. Boone Pickens would have to buy 10% of the company. Oh, wow. That's where it's gone. And, and yeah. what is it about? Exxon's not doing enough about it. And it's true. They're not putting the investments into the carbon sequestration, trying to reduce their carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Chevron, same thing. The shareholder, two days later, after that, last month, Chevron shareholders said, hey, you want, we got to move forward on this. Now, the oil companies that are doing this, think about Exxon, probably the largest publicly traded oil company, them and Chevron. And a company that produces 100,000 barrels of oil was able to go into the bond market and get a 50% less cost of capital because they went in and said, we're green oil and we've mm -hmm. reduced our carbon footprint and we have a net zero now. And then all those ESG funds said, sweet, you meet our criteria, 2% on the bond market. Exxon, 3%. Yes. That's a big difference. 33% yep. higher cost yep. of capital. Yep. So, and they produce three, 4 million barrels a day equivalent. So, what I'm trying to get is the voluntary market. Last year, they produced about, call it 200 million credits. And you can't just make these credits without being certified by a, by a proper validator. Just like, you know, back in the old days of mining, a company would say, we got 10 million ounces of gold. Then you had Brex happen in the late 90s. And then the industry said, hold on a second. You got to get certified by a 43-101 firm that is rep reputable. And the industry itself corrected itself. It wasn't the lawmakers. It was the industry regulatory body, right? It wasn't the governments that mandated it. And now you can't just claim that you got 10 million ounces. You got to do the proper work to prove the technical aspect and you move forward. That's where it's happened in the last 20 years in the carbon market, because I would never buy a carbon credit from 20 years ago from some bucket shop that you can't really verify. Yep. The carbon credits trade on exchanges and platforms. Uh, and they've created a futures market for carbon and a company like uh, uh, Shell, well, put this into context. Apple went and invested millions of dollars three years ago onto a blue carbon. Uh, I call it blue carbon, a mangrove forest. And uh, they're going to get 30,000 credits a year from that. Mm -hmm. Right. So for Shell to be able to get a hundred or 130 million credits, that's over 50% of the market right there. So if you just took Exxon and Shell, and then there's something called scope one, that's direct carbon emissions. Scope two is direct and indirect. And scope three, just Exxon's scope three would need 450 million carbon credits a year for the next 30 years to go net neutral. They only produced 200 last year. So I want that to really sink oh, yeah. in to all the so audience. And the question here. is, how do you make money off of this if you're a retail investor? There's there's various ways. So I'm not an ETF guy because I believe you can get larger leverage by picking right and sitting tight. But there's there's ETFs out there that you can go and buy for direct exposure to the carbon credit price. Uh, like there's KRBN and, and different. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go on to the, in the Europe, you can go into their ATS um, there, there's many private companies trying to create sequestration. Uh, I, I don't invest in science projects. There's many companies trying to do DAC, which is called direct air capture, uh, direct air captures, trying to sequester the carbon that's already in the mm -hmm. atmosphere. That to me is like, uh, producing gold from the ocean. There's lots of gold in the ocean, that really, uh, multi billionth, you know, Per, per, per billion could do it, but it would cost you like a hundred thousand dollars an ounce to do that. Yeah. Probably the cost to do DAC right now would be probably about a thousand bucks a ton for carbon. Um, there's a couple of companies doing it. The universities buy that sequestered carbon and then their lab, you know, they're, they, they, they say yeah. we're, but they buy like 
five tons of it a year. Not a big deal. Uh, I'd stay away from that. I think that's 20, 30, 40 years away. Um, companies like uh, Amazon and Google, they're investing huge amount of money into this sequestering. Oil companies, believe it or not, there's a lot of oil companies using huff and puff technology, uh, trying to sequester it. They think they can do it at about a hundred bucks a ton. Okay, so say they think they can do it, but then they need to build pipelines. Remember, moving CO2 is not like you're moving oil and gas. I do believe that's a great solution, sequestering it from the source, which is the oil well, and it's the material sector, you know, mining and the oil and gas guys that you really need to improve this in North America. But it's going to cost somewhere between 50 to 150 bucks per ton once they figure this stuff out and build their pipelines over the next 10 years. The best way to do this is to go and buy carbon credits by building it. Companies that are doing this by AAA certified groups like by Gold or Vera, mm-hmm. uh, different certification platforms. And they're doing it for eight to 10 bucks per ton right now. Yeah. So you know that you've got runway to 40, 50 bucks easily. Mark Carney, a former Canada's uh, bank, uh, governor of the bank, Canada, the former governor of England, one of the few guys that has been the governor for two countries. He's created this group working saying that, you know, it's about a billion dollars a year market right now for the voluntary market. It has to get to a hundred billion. Mm. Um, that's a hundred fold increase. Angela Merkel, you know, one of the longest serving uh, ca- chancellors mm-hmm. in Germany said the price of carbon is not high enough. It has to go up to over two, 300 bucks a ton because the companies aren't going to be forced to do it. And realistically she's right now. Right. For the people that don't believe that carbon is the issue or it's just natural, that doesn't matter. It, it's like debating, is there a God? Yeah. But if I could take a royalty on the Catholic Church, that's a pretty good business. Well, yeah, absolutely. I love that analogy, too, because I know like when we do this, we have some people, uh, when I've, I've had people talk about green stuff, and then I've had people talk about oil and gas, and I always get emails with people who have the political uh, you know, perspective. And, and that's never really what I'm trying to do here. It's, uh, you know, just the facts. And the facts are that there's a trend going on and there's potentially money to be made with that trend. And that's kind of what you're, what you're talking about. Well, look, all the banks are going to, we're just ahead of it here. Here's yeah. the exact truth. Like you're look at all the mining, uh, crypto miners, you know, the, the wrinkle was twins. They said, okay, yeah. we got to go in and buy 4 million credits a year till we reduce our own and create green energy, right. blah, blah, blah. It, it's happening across right. the board. And right. the voluntary market is the place to be. In my opinion, mm-hmm. I put up serious money to do that. I'm not here to talk my book. I just think it's the best risk. To, like I built a lot of mines. Okay. And it's never easy. Nobody wants you to build a mine. Nobody wants it in their backyard, you right. know, the NIMBY crowd. But nobody thinks that, hey, wait a second, you know, this this uh-huh. thing called an iPhone, where do you think they get the materials from? You know, every year, uh, uh, Apple recycles something like 35,000 ounces of gold because they know, you know, they have to do it. But where are they getting the cobalt and all these different factors? That's the reality, but it's still really hard to do it. On this one, even if you don't believe it, and you think it's carbon's a tax, well, you know that the sector is going to be a huge increase. And you know that with trillions of dollars of stimulus, and, and I just ask yourself, pull up the hottest days, like, you know, I, I just, last week in Vancouver, we had the hottest day ever on record for, you know, in June. And so I decided to pull up all the daily records, the, the top 10 recorded days in the last 100 years, we're all in the last six years. Mm-hmm. Now, people argue, yeah, but that's just like a natural heat cycle and, you know, it's a sun cycle. And blah, blah. Okay, that's what you want to believe. But the powers above that control the FMC and eventually MMT, they're going to put trillions of dollars towards this. Exactly. And all I'm saying is you can get a piece of the action. Now, you can bitch and be part of the peanut gallery. <laughs> you, or know, you can you accept can the be, facts of what is really, really out there yeah, and potentially well, make some be, money. <laughs> and even if it works out that in 50 years, yeah. it proves that we weren't, humans weren't the cause of this and it was cyclical, that's fine. You could be right. But if you play this, you can be very rich. And I'd rather be rich than 
bitter and right. <laughs> you don't want to yeah. be that guy sitting in the corner, bitter and right. You want to yeah. be that guy in the corner with all your friends and family and yeah. rich and happy. I could talk to you forever, man, um, but I want to make sure I'm respectful of your time. Tell tell us a little bit about the, uh, well, obviously we have the book and we've, we've talked about that. That is called The Rise of America, Remaking the World Order, which uh, I've, you know, I've gone through and we're going to discuss in our private group. But you also have a great newsletter. Tell us a little bit about that and how people can get involved. Sure. So the newsletter started five years ago this week. Uh, and what it is, is basically an, a truly independent thought. You can't pay me to get into our reports in the KRO. Uh, it's where I think there's opportunities. You know my style. Yep. I've got a pretty deep Rolodex of, you know, we do videos and site visits where I bring my crew in. And I know that the average person, let's say if you're a teacher or real estate or doctor or whatever, engineer, you can't do what I'm doing. And, and you could if you put the time in, but you have a job and family. Well, I go to these mines, I bring my film crew, and I show you what an underground mine looks like. And, and I show the problems or the op, you know, the options or the optimism and, and how it goes, whether it's from an oil well to a geothermal project, you know, run of river, uh, different places, gold mines, copper mines. We, we, we even went to the, we were the only group ever allowed to film the largest uranium uh, mill on the planet. And that was equivalent of 2.8 billion barrels of oil a year of energy to put into, you know, pure comparable. So that's what I write. Uh, we also, one big benefit of what we call the Kachuta Resource Opportunities, I call it the KRO, is when I do a large financing where I put up, you know, 10 million personally into a deal, I tell the company, I go, hey, you know, when I grew up in this business, I invent like literally, and I'm not here to brag. I, I invented that model because I'd sit in the crowd. I was just a young guy, man. I'd yeah. go to these investment conferences and, you know, all these like big names like Doug Casey and Rick Rule, like, yeah, I did that PP private placement, you know, we peel the stock and we ride the warrant. I go, what the fuck is a warrant? I didn't learn right. that. And I go back to my CFA <laughs> book, like a nerd and like, warrant, warrant. Fuck, there's no warrant. You know, warrant, you Google it, it's for your arrest, right? I'm going, what the <laughs> fuck is going on here? So after I figured this game out, I went, this is fucking bullshit. The whole system was based off of these management teams would get the cheap stock. Then they go to like, back in the day, these old white guys who are influencers, they get like the next seed. And then when, you know, they have big retailers and they would talk about the stock and everyone would blow up their paper to these crowd. And I'm sitting there going, fuck, I am that sheep. I'm in the crowd. Right. So in 2006, I had this idea that, fuck, why not let the crowd in at the same time, cut out the fucking bankers right. and make the management sit, pay the same price. It was like right. a really not, it's kind of common yep. sense, but back then it was a very novel idea. And um, it turned out that people were craving this. Sure. And uh, like on the last deal, we had 368 million US dollars in demand. The company's going to take a little over 105. And you, the subscriber, get to have the same price as the chairman of the company or the president or CEO of the company, the same price as me. And no fees are paid to any bankers because bankers are wankers. They <laughs> add zero fucking value to the game. They right. wear fancy suits. They're always, you, you've never seen a fat banker because they have so much time to work out and bullshit and play. They have the nice hands. Oh, fuck, man, I don't got time to even see my kids. I'm working like a madman. And this fucker comes in to pitch me a deal. And I'm sitting there going, wait a second. Like, I put this deal together. You want a fee? Get the fuck out of here, right? So that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the business. It's caused me lots of enemies. It's caused me a lot of problems. Sure. Uh, the regulators are like, ah, why the fuck are you doing this if you're not taking fees? I go, well, I put up millions of dollars and, and I get paid for my subscribers to cover the costs of research. I got a big staff. Uh, to put it into perspective, you know what I did exactly this week, a year ago, I had to, you know, it was a pandemic and we had to uh, book a plane for my engineers and geos to go to a project after I spent three months on desktop analysis, like going through the data right. room. And then I had to go to site and, you know, my subscribers got in at the same price as me at the same time zero fees and it's turned out to be probably the number one performing gold stock yeah. in America. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of what we do. Uh, it's not every Wednesday we have a new stock pick. We went five months with no stock picks. Right. And, and the biggest thing is I'm going to do let everyone sell before I sell. 
And I remember in September, I put a big sell on all the gold. And I don't know if you remember, like Equinox was 17 and a half bucks. I said, look, you guys should sell now. And I'd get hate mail. What the fuck's wrong with you, Mary? Uh, gold's going to the moon. It's 2000 bucks an ounce. I go, this stuff's so cyclical. Or there's an yeah, issue yeah. with the mine. Just take some money off the table. Take a Katusa free ride. Then I put the formula there. Now that same company's eight and a half bucks. I'm personally buying a lot. And it's a way better company today than a year ago. They bought another awesome gold deposit, but the market sentiment has changed. Yet gold is still 1800 and change an ounce. Right. So you, and the, the key is I, I really show value and analysis of when to sell. What are the catalysts? What are we looking for? Where am I wrong? I'm going to be wrong. I'm not perfect. I'm just a normal guy who works hard and bets at the same price as everyone else. But I break it down into tranches. How do you go about investing? How much should you put in? What is a speculation versus what is an investment, right? So we break down all of these different features. And in every one of the financings, I say, hey, I'm the lead order. This is how much I'm taking at this price. If you guys want to come along, great. It makes no difference in my world whether you participate or not. Right. But if you like it, contact the company. You can maybe get a seat at the table if you meet the criteria. Usually the criteria, as you know, um, these lawyers, it just pisses me accredited off so investors. much. Uh, the accredited factor. Now, when I first started in the business, remember, I, I knew nobody. I wasn't accredited. And I remember sitting there going, what the fuck? You know, why is this? You let me go to Vegas and gamble. You let me buy lottery tickets. You let me buy booze. You, I'm old enough to go fight in a war for you and uh, you can do online sport gambling, but you're not going to let me buy a fucking stock that I've done research on because you're protecting me. And, and here's a perfect example. One of the stocks that we've done that you participated in, it was a dollar financing with a full five-year Katusa warrant that's going to list and trade on the big board in the US and the NASDAQ at mm-hmm. a buck 50. Mm-hmm. The stock is trading 250 in the market. When I look, I, I, there's no secret about it. You know, it was a pandemic. The company can do a, a, a road show. I said, I'll put up 10 million personally. My buddies will come in for the rest. I'll guarantee you guys a $50 million deal. And they said, well, you're, you're being, we think it's worth 250, two bucks a share, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, then fuck, go deal with a banker. I'm out. They came back and said, okay, is this guaranteed? I go, yeah, here it is in writing. Let's move forward. We price protected it. Once the news came out, the stock went from like a buck 90 cents to it went to like as high as five bucks. And now it's at that two and a half buck range. Mm-hmm. But the regulators won't allow you to buy it at a dollar and you get a warrant at a buck 50, which is going to trade 50 cents to $2, somewhere around that range. But they'll let you buy that same stock for 250 in the open market. Yeah. Well, it fortunately, makes, it blows my mind. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's an unfair situation. Totally. Fortunately, we have um, in my group, and this, uh, you know, we have 2,000, I have 2,000 accredited investors that are actually signed up for our private group. And I usually don't uh, make any suggestions to people publicly, but I do think that people really ought to be following uh, Marin's uh, newsletter. Can you tell us again? Uh, what, what's the website again, just so that people can, uh, it's Katusa, K-A-T-U-S-A research.com. And look, whether you sign up or not, there's tons of free yeah. stuff. Like every week I write about stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll challenge management teams when I publish my sure. swap line stuff, you know, I showed that, Hey, the bankers make 87% of their commissions from non swap line nations. And I'm just telling them that 87% of their revenue is a bad place to be. So they did not like what I had to write. And, and it's kind of a, you know, our group, the KRO, the subscribers, we've raised more money for financings than the three largest Canadian brokerages combined. Wow. And we don't take fees. Yeah. So the bankers really don't like me because I, I'm dipping into their Ferrari fund and their mistress fund, right? <laughs> so... It's my style and it's part of the success of the KRO. Yep. I, I, I'm for the, I started with like, yeah, I got a chip on my shoulder. My parents called me Marin, you know, and they call me Muddy. And, and, and growing up with a name like that, every teacher didn't know how to name me. Of course, you know, like, of course I got a chip on my shoulder. Talk to me for five <laughs> minutes. You know, I, I got a chip on my shoulder. 
But we've worked our way up that I fight for the little guy. For example, I don't know if you read the last month's uh, newsletter that came out last week. I got a couple of really big swinging dick buddies and, and they're multi-billionaires. And it, one of them asked for like 10 million bucks and it's fine. He goes, well, if you're doing 10, I want 10. I go, dude, I can't get you 10. Like, you know, come on. And I go, look, you're just going to be passive. Think of this as a kiss. Take 250. It, it, your kids will love it. He's like, you know what, Marin? He sends me an email. He goes, you know what? It's not worth my time, blah, blah, blah. Cool. But he was nice about it. Another guy that I've never even met wanted a big swing, same size, and writes me the worst email you can think. You're a fucking prick. You're an asshole. Who the fuck do you think you are? I'm like, dude, you're out. I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. But all the guys who asked for 50 grand or less, they had got their full allocation. Yeah. Now, of course, I'm not a part of the company and I'm not a, a broker, so I don't get involved in the allocations. But, you know, I made sure that the little guys were taken <laughs> care of. The big right. boys, they got pulled back because guess right. what? If I gave that 10 million bucks to that one guy and he's already up two and a half, three times his money, would that change his life? Fuck yeah. no. Yeah. But taking 10 million average 25, so taking 40 guys or uh, 200 guys at 50 grand, and they can triple their money. Now that could actually change their life. Right. So right. I'm about the little guy because I was the little guy when I started out. Like I didn't have a brother or a dad in the business that was like the dude who can get me a job and this and that. I, I literally knew nobody. I used to walk around these conferences. I was so scared, Buck, to even ask questions of management team. Sure. Because I didn't know, like, like I didn't want to feel stupid. Like right. I knew nothing about this stuff. Yeah. So I know what it feels like being the guy. Now, you know, fuck, when I walk through the, the halls, the companies are scared that I'm going to expose them for being the fucking stupid ones, right? And right. I just don't touch, right. you know, there's, you just don't need, what do we have, five gold companies in our portfolio? That's all you need. You don't need mm -hmm. 50. Mm -hmm. Like there's guys out there, you know, my peers, these newsletter writers who are not allowed to buy stocks, but they're going to tell you what to buy. That makes sense. Um, and they have 50 gold stocks. Why don't you just buy the GLD, which is an ETF, and, and not bother right. with it? Because right. the commissions are going to kill you anyways. Right. I, I don't believe in that style. So yeah. that's just kind of, uh, I guess I'm unique in my own yeah. perspective. Absolutely. Uh, and and uh, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to do it. Why? Because it's fun. Yeah. I have the best gig in the world. I appreciate it, man. And I appreciate you very much. Uh, Marin Katus, everybody. Marin, thanks again for being on Wealth Formula Podcast. I'd love to have you back soon. You have to make me a promise. You haven't come to one of my conferences since <laughs> 2017. I know. I had Tika there, and uh, I always <laughs> loved having you around. We're going to do one next year. Uh, we're going to call it Kiss because when I was a little kid, my favorite band was Kiss. Oh, yeah. So it's going to be it's going to be called Katusa's Investment Summit Series, just because it sounds cool. And what we're going to do, I want to get you up on stage. Um, and then uh, I'm going to have all the big ballers in, in our mining world there. I'm going to have some very special guests that are really like top tier people. But we're also going to do a site visit on the third day to an operating gold mine. So we're going to announce all that stuff. So uh, you got to make a promise. Oh, I'll be there. Because so, you've missed be the last few. You've missed yeah, the last few. Had a, had a few things going on in the <laughs> I heard. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty complicated. <laughs> I'm glad you're through it. All right, buddy. Take care. And uh, all the best. We'll, we'll, we'll love to have you back soon. Take care. All right, buddy. Bye -bye. Take care. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. You know, it's it, this is not easy stuff, okay? And Marin actually talked about a lot of stuff that's not really necessarily even in the book, but I do encourage you to read that as well. One of the things that I think is really important about this whole message that Marin has, and I think it's, you know, I think it's something to take home with you, is that politics really has no place in investing, right? As investors, ultimately, we are here to see what is reality, not what we wish it could be or our strong opinions of why something is, but what actually is happening what looks to be happening next and what we can potentially do to benefit from it. That's what an investor does. It is not a political thing. So 
listen, I know you may have strong opinions about the environment and all that. I'm going to keep mine to myself. But what I can say is that we are at an inflection point right now where it's pretty clear which way the world is headed. And do yourself a favor, read Marin's book and try to learn something from it. And I also would encourage you to, you know, get onto his newsletter. That's it for me this week on Wealth Formula Podcast. This is Buck Joffrey signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.